Okay, so on top renewables are already will need approval under the EBBC process. Um, there are a hundred waiting for approval. So what are you saying essentially here is that they need to be approved to the same standard as a, a new coal project? They need to be assessed for the environmental impact that they're having, on, particularly on remnant yeah. vegetation. Now, but unfortunately, they are at the, the government moment, doesn't. But are you saying it's not r as rigorous not, as it not needs to, the same to be? Scale. Not as not as rigorous, and particularly, not even local governments are getting a say in terms of the approval processes. Hmm. They're being railroaded by state governments, overrided by state governments. So it starts even as far back as the implications for local government in being able to plan for their roads and their infrastructure to be able uh, to support this type of infrastructure. But then it's yeah. about the environmental impacts. The rigour around that isn't as, isn't as, as uh, onerous as what it is for resources. But yet the same impact on knocking down remnant vegetation exists. We see it, we live with it, and we just say to those that, that uh, lie at the altar of renewables, come out and have a look at what's being done to some of the remnant vegetation the habitat that's being lost. You're looking at Yungala, uh, a pumped hydro. You're going to see um, uh, platypus habitat being flooded where they won't be able to live, but a rare white eel um, that is rare to Australia uh, will be lost if this is undertaken. So where is the environmental impact statements on those, on the implications yeah. of those? Instead, it's been approved and we're, moving, and we're rushing through this. Well, in the last week, we've heard Barnaby Joyce say uh, net zero by 2050 is utterly untenable. So what do you say to those who bring a cynical mind to this argument uh, that you're bringing today, that you're trying to kill off net zero by stealth and you don't really believe in it? No, this is Labor's net zero by, by not 2050. Hang by, on. The Nationals signed up for it, didn't the, they? Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. There's a differentiation. Don't conflate the two. Uh, Labor's net zero is a lot different to what the Coalition's net zero was. Ours was about technology, it was about investing in technology and as well as making sure renewables had a place. But it was planned and it was planned properly so there wasn't unintended consequences. But we also invested in technology like carbon capture storage for gas and coal. In fact, the Biden administration uh, just announced $1.2 billion in carbon capture storage projects to make sure that we live up to our international commitments of reducing emissions by giving us reliable energy. And that's why the Nationals have led for over a decade the conversation that needs to happen around the emerging technology on nuclear, zero emission technology that can go in where existing coal-fired power stations are. We don't need 28,000 kilometres of new transmission lines, which will save billions of dollars, nearly $100 billion that Australians are going to pay for. So we're just saying there was a way through this. Our net zero is a lot different to what Labor's is and the fact that they've accelerated 2030 is putting all this pressure, pressure on electricity bills that you're paying for now. We're saying there's a better way. And in fact, Peter Dutton and I are saying there's a better way than what uh, the Morrison-Joyce government put because we're prepared to have the courage to, ha to add to that technology mix nuclear. And I think that's a common sense solution. I'm proud Peter Dutton and I are prepared to advance as a conversation across the country. So do you essentially agree with Barnaby Joyce? <coughs> No, we believe in our international commitments uh, and we, because if we don't, let me make this clear, uh, if we hadn't signed up to net zero, uh, your interest rate today, capital markets, both private and public, we're going to mm. factor in an additional one and a half to three percent. Uh, and, and so mortgage payers will be paying for that. Our farmers will be paying that on their, on their interest bills, but they'd also be getting less for their commodities because they'd be tariff because we hadn't made that international commitment. Yeah. Uh, and so um, do you really want to change, do you really want to change tack now? in a cost of living crisis and go back out there and say, let's blow up net zero commitment that we've made mm. uh, and cost Australians a whole lot extra. We're saying we've got time. We don't need to do this by 2030. We can, we can plan and get this properly uh, achieved, live up to international commitments and make sure that we have a finally affordable energy yeah. that's reliable and reduces our emissions. But we don't have time. Isn't, isn't that the point? And I'm not talking about the climate aspect all of all this. I'm talking about the report from AEMO who said essentially renewables aren't catching up um, with the speed in which we need them and therefore, you know, places like Ararin coal needs to be extended. That's not an ideal situation, is it? And you're talking about nuclear, yes. but at what point do you become pragmatic and say, well, look, we can keep on talking about um, nuclear and that can be your end goal to get there, but you've got to do something in the meantime. Well, this is exactly what I is saying. The government's not being pragmatic by trying to rush to 82% renewables by 2030. It can't be achieved. That's 22,000 solar panels a day must be laid. 
40 wind turbines a month must be put up. Mm. There's not the supply chain for even that type of infrastructure to be sent to Australia, from China mostly, mm. uh, to be able to get here and be put up in time. And so what AEMO is saying is a very loud message to this government is that their ideology isn't meeting the practical reality and why other state governments are now having to make the right decision in making sure that we don't rush this and that we actually need to keep, like Araring, going longer and having to make sure that we do have that affordable ride power. But it's also a big message to take away all the handbrakes that have taken away investment confidence, particularly with gas, uh, we are drawing down on gas supplies rather than firming up renewables that, that's required with gas. This yeah. government has demonised gas and they're not prepared to drill holes, so you're going to pay more. So that the warnings are not for an EMO to rush. They're saying, get this policy settings right. I wrote to the Prime Minister who became leader and said, let's have a National Energy Summit. Let's mm. talk about everything uh, that's on the table. But he, he turned his back on me and, unfortunately, we're paying the price for that at the moment. And the Prime Minister needs to intervene because Chris Bowen is out of his depth on this one. His ideology isn't meeting the practical reality of what's being bled out of Australians' wallets at the moment. Yeah, we're feeling it. David Littleproud, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me.